Hello, friends, and welcome back to r slash pro revenge. Today we have a fresh compilation about a neighborhood routine and, of course, revenge. And if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. And our first story. You robbed the wrong guy. Just some quick history to set the stage. At a younger age, I moved from Chicago to Baltimore to take a job with the federal government. When I started, I hit it off with a couple of guys who've since become my best friends. We all lived together for about five years until one by one we started moving on, getting married, etc. One guy, we'll call him John, left our place of employment and took a job as a secret service agent. As everyone went their separate ways, I thought I'd make a smart decision as a young professional and buy a house. In 2007, right before the financial collapse. Needless to say, immediately after buying, I was upside down big time and struggling. I had some other co-workers move in, but they only lasted about a year before abruptly moving out, leaving me scrambling to find a roommate, thus setting the stage for my revenge story. I ended up posting on a bunch of venues to find a new roommate. One guy ended up far and above the best option. We'll call him Russell. Russell was a military vet who'd served a couple of tours downrange and was now a sous chef at a local restaurant. He was easy to get along with, so I pulled the trigger in haste without doing the proper checks I should have, primarily due to being in a desperate financial situation. The first sign something was off was when Russell moved in. He came with just a couple of boxes and a TV. No bed, no furniture. Next clue came when he was chatting me up about his time in the military. On the surface, he could talk the talk, but as I got more nuanced, his answers became more, well, wrong. He claimed he used to be a former ranger, so he would have known the topics discussed. The final clue was a classic one. He started making excuses for rent payment on month two. By this time, I knew something was not right, so I politely told Russell to move out, which he did immediately. Once gone, I went to Home Depot to buy new locks, and much to my surprise, my debit card didn't work. Come to find out, Russell had stolen a checkbook and cleaned me out. Every cent I had in my account was gone. At this time, I was feeling a mixture of anger and fear of not being able to pay my mortgage and disappointment in myself for not vetting them properly. When I ended up telling John, he was livid. He wanted every detail about the situation. Little did I know, John told all his co-workers and they immediately opened a case on Russell. For those of you who don't know, the Secret Service also deals with financial slash economic crimes, albeit normally on a much larger scale than my savings account. Within a few days, Secret Service agents had tracked him down and interrogated and arrested all the individuals who had cashed the fake checks on Russell's behalf. One turned and advised Russell would be at Dick's Last Resort at the Baltimore Inner Harbor that night. John and his crew changed into plain clothes and went there to wait. Lo and behold, Russell shows up and acts like he owns the place. He started announcing that he was leaving on deployment to Iraq, so he wanted to buy the entire bar drinks, with my money, I should add. As he was standing there paying for everyone's drinks, John stood up and screamed, Secret Service, you're under arrest. Three agents slammed him down, cuffed him, and pulled him out to where two black SUVs rolled up on the boardwalk to take him away. My other friend who'd gone to observe said the entire restaurant paused in stunned silence for about 30 seconds. They take Russell in, and by this time, John says he's crying his eyes out. The best part of the ordeal? John made him add in his written confession, I routinely pretend to be an army ranger, but have never served. Before being taken to the city jail, Russell asked John, why did the Secret Service arrest me? To which John replied, you robbed the wrong guy. Needless to say, I was a bit more careful in choosing my next roommate. And our next story. Busybody, stay-at-home mom neighbor, harasses me until my restraining order kicks her out of her house. I lived across the street from a very bored stay-at-home mom whose excess idle time turned her into an insufferable busybody. Her husband backed out of the driveway and slammed into my roommate's car parked on the curb. He apologized, gave us insurance info, and took care of it. He was never a problem because he accepted responsibility for what he did. His wife, however, demanded that we never ever park any cars at the curb again, because we can't get out of our driveway otherwise. The street was very wide. She was just completely unable to accept that the accident was her husband's fault and figured we were somehow responsible for it. Ergo, we were responsible for preventing it in the future. 
We told her that we would avoid parking there whenever possible, but that we still had the legal right to park on the street, and that if necessary, we would still do so, and that it was her husband's responsibility to avoid hitting other people's legally parked cars when backing out of the driveway. She wasn't happy with that answer, but just told us we better stay out of her family's way and stormed off. One day, she came storming over, banging on the front door, cussing us out, when we got her on our security camera saying, if you don't move that effing car in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to effing total it with my truck. It'll be your fault, and you'll have to pay for the damage to my effing vehicle. To this, I simply responded, I don't know whose car that is, but I didn't park it there. I have you on camera, so if you do anything to that car, I'll have to call the police and hand over this tape. She then threatened to sue me for invasion of privacy for recording her and still insisted that we move the car even though it wasn't our property. We just ignored her. She didn't do anything to the car. We did keep the recording, though. A few weeks later, I had a friend visit from out of town. He parked his car on the curb, then started unloading some stuff from his trunk. She came storming out, screaming and cussing at him. I've told you repeatedly, never park your effing car on this curb. If you don't move it, I'm going to effing total it, and you can effing pay for a new GD car, as well as the damage you do to mine. He tried to calm her down and asked if there was somewhere else he could park, and she replied, You can park it in hell, because that's where you'll be after I effing kill you. Unfortunately for her, he had his dash cam running the whole time, and it captured everything. He called the police, and she was arrested for threatening to commit vandalism and for threatening violence. A few days later, she left a long-winded hate letter in our mailbox, written as if it were an open letter from the entire neighborhood. And it basically said that nobody knows who you are and everybody wishes you would move away and nobody wants you living in our neighborhood. Thing is, she forgot about the security cameras. I took the video of her opening my mailbox, which included her taking all of our letters out of the mailbox and rifling through them. I gave them to the post office. This led her to getting arrested for a second time that week. After that, we used her two arrests, our collection of security and dash cam footage, and her letter to get a restraining order against her that actually prohibited her from entering her own home. Then we called the police every time we saw her because she was in violation of the order. She ended up having to live in a hotel, and her husband came over, apologized to us, and asked if we would drop the restraining order so his wife could come home. I told him I would do it, but only if she wrote me, my wife, our roommates, and the friend of mine she threatened a one-page apology for her harassment, and that she would promise to never, ever contact us again for any reason whatsoever moving forward. I received no apology, and the house went on the market a week later. And our last story. How to train your roommate. This is the story of how I used Pavlovian conditioning to train my formerly obnoxious roommate to behave like a responsible adult. So the three of us are nurses, and we all live in this company-provided apartment. Each of us has his own room, which is joined by this common area that doubles as a kitchen and dining area, but the walls are paper-thin and don't provide enough soundproofing. So if one were to, say, have a loud conversation in the common area during the late hours of the night, it would resonate through all the rooms adjacent. But if you were in your own room talking to somebody, it wouldn't be heard outside. Basically, any sound that you make on the common room could be heard in all the rooms. Now, this isn't a problem during the day, but at night when everyone is asleep, our one obnoxious roommate always decides to have his Facebook video calls on the common room using his phone, waking everyone up with his loud conversations. And since we're nurses, we have to work in shifts. Me and the second roommate work on a 12-hour day shift, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., while the third obnoxious one works on a 12-hour night shift, 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. So the third roommate tends to be awake at night. We get to sleep soundly when our third roommate has worked, but every time he doesn't have to go to work, the two of us tend to be disturbed by his late-night blabbering on his phone. We tried to handle it the adult way, by talking to him about it and suggesting he do his antics inside his own room since... While we're in there, we wouldn't hear his loud conversations, and he wouldn't wake us up at night, especially if we had to go to work in the morning. This worked for a while, but eventually he went back to his old habits of waking us up at night. We were getting so tired of the situation because all we wanted to do after a long 12-hour shift was be able to sleep soundly, especially if we still had to go to work the next day. Our hallelujah came from an episode of The Office that I just watched, wherein Jim trained Dwight to crave a breath mint every time he restarted his computer. 
A light bulb suddenly switched on in my head to use our Wi-Fi to train my noisy roommate. Nobody else knew that I had admin privileges. I just happened to be there when the guys installed it and they gave me the key. I realized that I had access to our Wi-Fi network wirelessly on my phone and could turn it on and off on a whim like a god. My MO was simple. Every time I get woken up by noisy roommate taking his internet calls in the common room, I would turn off the Wi-Fi of the whole house and wait until he goes back to his room before turning it on again. The training took months and countless late nights. After getting woken up at night by said roommate, I'd wait for an opportune time, usually when he was deep in a loud conversation with someone, to turn off the Wi-Fi. I then wait for him to get annoyed and curse our service provider until he finally gives up and goes to his room. Cue for me to turn it back on. The late night calls in the common room became less and less until he no longer took them in the common room at all. This translated to silent nights for me and the second roommate who had to work in the morning. My method was so effective that he actually thought there was a problem with his phone. Sometime later, he wanted to show me a video of something on his phone but said that I had to come to his room to show me since there was a problem with it and it wouldn't work in the common room. I was grinning like the devil the entire time. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video to the end, and I'll see you in the next one.